Today I will summarize the paper Rates and Style of Cenozoic Deformation Around the Gonghe Basin, Northeastern Tibetan Plateau. This paper was written by Kredok and collaborators and published in 2014 in the journal Geosphere. Along the northeastern margin of the Tibetan Plateau, active shortening and crustal thickening are distributed across a wide region extending from the Kunlun Fault in the south to the Hoshi Corridor north of the Chilean Shan. Geodetic data suggest that present-day rates of shortening are 4 to 6 mm per year along a north-northeast cross-section across this region. High topography across this region is associated with broad sedimentary basins and east-west trending fault-bounded mountain ranges, as shown by this map here that includes elevations of basins and ranges. Although some ranges in northeastern Tibet likely experienced deformation in Eocene time, Widespread exposures of neogene quaternary basin fill suggest that most of these ranges are associated with truss faults that initiated during the middle to late Miocene. But geomorphic observations along fault-bounded range fronts indicate that many have been active during the Holocene, although only few of these fault networks have experienced instrumental earthquakes. Current thinking about the kinematics of deformation interior to northeastern Tibet has been shaped by observations from the intracontinental strike slip faults that bound this part of the plateau, the Kunlun and the Haiyuan faults. Along the Kunlun fault, a pronounced eastward decrease in left lateral displacement rates from over 10 mm per year across the central Kunlun to less than 2 mm per year near the eastern fault terminus suggests that fault displacement dies out within the plateau. If this is so, then where is this leap rate gradient accommodated? First, recent studies have suggested that this slip rate gradient may be accommodated by internal deformation within the plateau and regional clockwise rotation of the Kunlun fault. Another possibility is that displacement is transferred northward across the interior of northeastern Tibet to the Haiyuan fault. Focusing on the second possibility, a recent inversion of geodetic and geologic data suggests that sleep along the Elashan and Riyueshan faults could indeed accommodate sleep rate gradients along the eastern Kunlun fault. But this model requires relatively high rates of sleep from 4 to 6 mm per year along these structures in order to accomplish complete transfer of sleep. The thing is, geologic and geomorphic data suggest that right lateral slip rates along the Elashan and Riryue uh, Shan faults are only about 1 mm per year. So this means that significant deformation must occur between the Kunlun and the Haiyuan faults on other structures in addition to the Elashan and Riryue Shan faults. So this paper here documents the rates and style of shortening along several of the primary structures likely to absorb contractional deformation between the Kunlun and the Haiyuan faults. And in this study, they focus particularly on the Qinghai Nanshan and Gonghe Nanshan. One of the most prominent structures interior to northeastern Tibet is a S-virgin trust system associated with the Qinghai Nanshan, which bounds the northern Gonghe Basin for around 200 km along strike. Likewise, in the southern part of the basin, a second S-virgin fault network bounds the Gonghe Nanshan and separates the northern basin 
from a southern subbasin, referred to as the Tongda subbasin. These two fault systems represent the primary contractional structures within northeastern Tibet between 99 degrees east and 101 degrees east. Both fault networks terminate to the west and east against the Alashan and Ryueshan faults, and both appear to be active today. So here I will summarize what they do in this paper. They address the rate and style of deformation along each of the fault systems adjacent to the Gongho pacing complex. Following a brief geologic background, structural measurements of deformed tertiary strata are combined with geomorphic observations in order to constrain uh, the structural architecture of the Qinghai Nangsheng and Gongho Nangsheng. Appetite fission track and appetite uranium thorium helium cooling ages in the hanging walls are used as independent constraints on the amount of structural relief. Together, these observations provide the basis for constructing serial deformed state cross sections through the ranges. Shortening estimates from deformed and restored cross sections in these and in previous studies provide the basis for determining uh, average geologic shortening rates across the Gongho region during the past around 5 to 10 million years. So they compare these long-term rates to rates determined along the northwest Qinghai Nangsheng from restoration of a displaced late Pliocene alluvial fan surface. And in the end, their results highlight slow and perhaps steady deformation along some of the largest range bounding fault networks interior to northeastern Tibetan Plateau. Now let's talk about the geology of the Qinghai Nangsheng. The Qinghai Nangsheng is one of the most prominent ranges in the interior of northeastern Tibetan Plateau. It extends east-west for around 200 kilometers and separates the Gongho Basin complex to the south from the Qinghai Lake Basin to the north. The range is located along a crustal boundary separating the Paleozoic Chilean origin from the Chidam terrain to the south. Geologic map patterns and topography indicate that the range consists of a series of range-scale asymmetric anticlines with broad, gently dipping northern limbs and steep, narrow southern limbs. The folds are related to a network of imbricate S virgin truss folds, which are blind along most of the Qinghai Nangsheng. The range is scored by Paleozoic Triassic sedimentary rocks, which are intruded by several phases of intermediate felsic plutons. The plutons in the central Qinghai Nangsheng appear to intrude rocks as young as Triassic in age. Now let's move to the geology of the Gongho Nangsheng. This range also extends east-west for about 200 kilometers along strike between the Elashan and the Ryueshang faults and separates the Gongho Basin into the northern and southern sub-basins, termed in this paper the Gongho Sub-Basin and the Tongda Sub-Basin, respectively. Similar to the Qinghai Nangsheng, the range consists of a series of asymmetric anticlines with broad, gently dipping northern limbs and steep, narrow southern limbs that are related to a network of imbricate S virgin truss faults. The faults outcropping deep exposures along the northern margin of the Tongda subbasin. So, like the Qinghai Nangsheng, the range exhibits a S virgin topographic asymmetry but it appears to be more deeply eroded than its neighbor to the north. The range is scored by Triassic Flish, since Cenozoic strata have generally been removed from the top of the range during topographic growth. 
Now let's see the evidence for fault growth in this region based on previous studies. Based on magnetostratigraphic and lithostratigraphic analysis of well-exposed sedimentary sections, sediment accumulation began during the early Miocene, at around 20 million years ago across the Gonghe region. They divided the depositional episodes since the early Miocene in three packages that they call M1, M2, and PQ, as shown in Figure 3. The map below Figure 3 is shown for locations. The early Middle Miocene stratigraphic package, named M1, consists of strata that were generally deposited in fluvial floodplain environments, in regions distal from source ranges. This depositional episode persisted until around 7 to 10 million years ago. The M2 package is characterized by a disruption of early Middle Miocene depot center during the late Miocene, by a pulse of sediment accumulation attributed to growth of ranges that define the present-day margin of the Gonghe Basin. Along the northwestern margin of the Chaka Subbasin, Cenozoic accumulation began locally at around 12 million years ago. From around 8 to 12 million years ago, the units consist of 700 meters of muddy, fluvial and lacustrine deposits. Overlying these basal deposits is an 800-meter-thick package of fluvial deposits that coarsens upward and dates to around 4.5 to 8 million years ago. Similar phases associations are observed in sections adjacent to the Gonghe Nanshan. They refer to the various Pliocene quaternary gravels and sands deposited on the basin margins as PQ and the abbreviations PQAL and PQFL distinguish between Pliocene quaternary strata that they interpret to be deposited in an alluvial fan or a fluvial environment, respectively. Along the margins of the Gonghe Basin complex, the uppermost strata consist of coarse-grained fluvial conglomerates that prograde into the basin. For example, in the Chaka Subbasin, this upper package is around 300 meters of alluvial fan deposits that range in age from around 4.5 million years ago to less than 3 million years ago. On the flanks of the Gonghe Nanshan, the uppermost 500 meters of the section consist of coarse alluvial fan and fluvial conglomerates, some of which are associated with the axial Yellow River, and these strata date to around 7 to 0 0.5 million years ago. So what is the timing of shortening, that is, timing of fault activity and range growth? Along the northern margin of the Chaka Basin, in the western part of the Qinghai Nanshan, shortening is bracketed to the past 6 million years. In the upper half of the basin fill, we have a coarsening upward sequence and a pronounced drainage reversal from N north flowing to S flowing paleocurrents. Moreover, this reversal corresponds to fanning dips that are interpreted as growth strata in the proximal footwall of the Qinghai Nanshantra's fault network. Now, in the south, along the northern margin of the Gonghe Nanshan, Now in the Gonghe Nanshan, similar changes attest to the onset of fault activity and range growth between 7 and 10 million years ago. In the southern Gonghe Basin, the lower stratigraphic packages, that is M1 and M2, in the southern Gonghe Basin are truncated by a prominent unconformity, which is overlain by the 500 meters of conglomerate that dates to around 7 to 0 0.5 million years ago. So in this study, they interpret these conglomerates to be coalesced alluvial fan deposits that were shed off high topography around the basin margins. Along both the southern and northern flanks of the Gonghe Nanshan, alluvial fan deposits exhibit growth strata 
and progressive unconformities, indicating the growth of the range and fault activity in the Gonghe Nanshan initiated between 7 and 10 million years ago, and persisted during accumulation of alluvial fan strata on the flanks of the range. Regionally, the onset of shortening along the Qinghai Nanshan and Gonghe Nanshan is similar to the onset of right lateral strike slip faulting along the eastern and western basin margins. Slip rates along the Yalashan Fault suggest that fault initiation occurred at around 9 plus or less 3 million years ago. This is slightly younger than fault movement in the southwest of the Yalashan Fault in the Dulanchaka Highland from around 17 to 12 million years ago. Similar to the Yalashan Fault, slip rates along the Ryu Yuashan Fault also suggest that fault initiation occurred at around 9 plus or less 3 million years ago. All of these estimates are similar to the 10 plus or less 3 million years ago initiation inferred for contractional stru structures along the northwestern margin of the Guaida Basin. In summary, geologic data consistently show that the initiation of shortening and strike slip faulting in this part of northeastern Tibet occurred at around 7 to 12 million years ago. This happened a few million years earlier in the Dulan Chaka Highlands to the west, whereas in the Chaka Basin it started at 6 million years ago. So hereafter in this summary, I will focus mostly on the Qinghai Nangshan. Following the sections on this paper, we will talk about the fault system architecture along the Qinghai Nangshan. They conducted detailed structural mapping at several locations along the Qinghai Nangshan range front. Generally, Cenozoic strata are steeply dipping along the range front and deep angles decrease toward the basin, where strata are nearly horizontal. In the Chaka region, in the northwest part of the range, they've done two structural transects. Along the eastern transect, the basal M2 and PQFL strata dip 30 degrees southwest, but are folded into a narrow, 1 km wide syncline near the range front. Bedding dips in the mid to upper levels of PQ progressively decrease upsection, such that the highest exposed PQAL strata are nearly flat lying. Along the western transect, the correlative beds uh, dip steeply around 50 degrees to 60 degrees to the southwest and they are folded into a small anticline that sits above a bedrock seal near the range front. Basal deposits great upsection into a more than one kilometer thick package of PQ sandstones and gravels. A second exposure of continuous section exists within the Yellow River Canyon along the flanks of far eastern Qinghai Nanshan near Gonghe City. In a tributary canyon north-northwest of Gonghe City, PQ gravels are in unconformable contact with the bedrock core of the Qinghai Nanshan and deep 45 degrees south. To the south, the PQAL strata are flat lying. Fanning dips in PQ strata along the eastern Qinghai Nanshan front provide a hint that the local timing of thrusting may be similar to what has been documented at Chaka. In this paper, they favor this explanation, but they acknowledge that timing is somewhat equivocal. In addition, another possible explanation could be that fanning dips at this locality may also reflect a fold hinge. Late Cenozoic strata are also well exposed on the flanks of granitic bedrock that outcrops 20 km east of Gonghe City. The range is bound by a northeast virgin truss fault along its eastern edge, 
which dips around 60 degrees west and has a vergence that is opposite to the vergence of faults bounding much of the Qinghainan Shan to the west. The range exhibits a pronounced asymmetry, with a faulted eastern flank and a broad, slightly tilted western flank. Within M2, there is evidence for growth strata, with deep angles in east dipping strata progressively decreasing upsection. Near the top of the outcrop, an unconformity occurs where beds dipping around 31 degrees southeast are truncated by 22 degrees southeast dipping beds immediately above. So they suggest that fault was active when M2 was being deposited. Although these M2 deposits have not been dated directly, they appear to be correlative, uh, the correlative with the 3.6 to 7 million years ago Hergia formation strata in the Guaida Basin to the east. If this is correct, it augments evidence for a synchronous shortening along the strike of the Qinghainan Shang. Although Cenozoic strata are not preserved along the crest of the Qinghainan Shang, the authors say that the topography of the range may contain information about its structural architecture. Comparing the southern and the northern limbs of the range, the southern has a steeply dipping strata, whereas the northern limb has a small slope, as already described. The authors also compare topographic relief which is the maximum elevation minus the minimum elevation within a 1 km radius circular window. The results are that the southern limb has a highly dissected topography with a local topographic relief exceeding 1000 meters. Meanwhile, in the northern limb, topographic relief is, is less than 100 meters. In figure 5c, they present the three topographic profiles shown in figure 5a. These profiles show maximum, minimum, and mean topography over 30 km wide swaths. Note that for the northern limb of the range, these three are nearly coincident. They interpret that the broad, flat, slightly north dipping surface along the northern side of the Qinghainan Shan is a relict erosion surface, shown in red, in red dashed lines in figure 5c, and these areas represent a paleo-horizontal structural marker and predates growth of the south virgin anticline that cores the range, making it a key constraint on the structural re relief of the Qinghainan Shan. They also note what is happening in the basin north of the Qinghainan Shan, the Qinghai Lake Basin. The basin has 500 to 1,000 meters of sediment, as revealed by seismic reflection surveys. In this figure, I added the profiles published by Ann and others in 2006 and plotted approximate locations of the profiles. These profiles show five main normal faults, shown in red in the figure, as well as the presence of an unconformity and growth strata. Now, getting back to this paper, the authors suggest that the deep strata of the southern part of the Qinghai Lake Basin have a similar dip to the northern limb of the Qinghai Nanshan, suggesting that this limb extends far north beneath the Qinghai Lake Basin. They say that this is augmented uh, evidence for the interpretation that the northern limb of the Qinghai Nanshan is a relict erosion surface. To determine the exhumation histories of hanging wall ranges, they collected low-temperature thermochronologic samples along vertical transects on the southern flanks of the Qinghainan Shan and Gonghenan Shan. The Qinghainan Shan transect is located in the central part of the range, and two additional samples were collected in the vicinity of the Chakai structural transect in the western Qinghainan Shan. Location, locations are shown as stars in this figure here. The cooling history of hanging wall blocks can be used to place bounds on the timing of fault slip, if exhumation is deep enough to drive cooling of more than around 50 degrees Celsius, or if exhumation is minimal, samples that resided above their closure temperatures when faulting began may represent a relict 
thermal stratigraphy that can passively record hanging wall motion. So for the methods, they used apatite uranium thorium helium thermochronology, which provides cooling ages. On appropriate samples, they determined correlations between cooling ages versus effective uranium concentrations, which enable well-constrained uh, inverse modeling of time temperature history. And finally, they performed apatite fission track analysis, which is also able to reveal the thermal history of rocks. Here are the results for the central Qinghai Nanshan. In general, uh, apatite fission track cooling ages for the central Qinghai Nanshan date to the early Cretaceous, from 103 to 113 million years ago. Apatite uh, helium cooling ages along the same transect range from approximately the middle of the Cretaceous to the Paleogene. Mean ages are 46 to 110 million years ago, and single grain ages are as young as 25 million years ago. Because all single grain ages are Paleogene or older, the age elevation arrays of uh, apatite helium and apatite fission track data from the Qinghai Nanshan indicate that estimation of the range has been insufficient to exhume rocks that reside at temperatures higher than around 65 plus or less 5 uh, degrees Celsius necessary to constrain apatite helium cooling history and far less than necessary to exhume samples that were above the apatite fission track closure temperature, which is about 105 plus or less 10 degrees Celsius. They also constructed an inverse time temperature model of cooling pathways for sample CT86. The model shows that a relatively narrow range of time temperature histories is permissible from around 55 to 25 million years ago, and permissible histories involve cooling through this time interval of perhaps 30 degrees Celsius and no more than 40 degrees Celsius. Although the model permits accelerated cooling after around 25 million years ago, the timing is too poorly constrained to say that. Now, prior to 55 million years ago, a wide range of time temperature cooling histories is permissible, including possible episodes of cooling and heating related to exhumation and reburial, and so they draw no conclusions about the history during this time. In the section of the paper called Thermochronologic Bounds on the Structural Relief, they use the results from thermochronology to evaluate the degree to which the formed state cross-sections through the ranges are admissible. So at typical geothermal gradients, uh, CT86 was buried by 1 to 3 kilometers of material at the end of the Paleogene. This is in the range of depth of the CT86 below the Qinghai Nanshan erosion surface and presumably neogene structural relief. In order to reconstruct Cenozoic deformation across the Qinghai and Gonghe Nanshan, they developed a series of balanced cross-sections and measured the line length shortening recorded along each. Deformed state and restored cross-sections are shown in figure 11, and location of transects is shown in figure 4 on the left. So to do that, several assumptions and simplifications were made in order to construct these structural models. For the Qinghai Nanshan sections, they used the structural measurements along the southern range front and geomorphic observations from the northern flank of the range to constrain the formed state fold, fold geometry. They ensured that the inferred structural depths are in accord with the constraints provided by the uh, apatite fission track and apatite helium data from the range. In general, they assumed that the fold limbs projected and intersected approximately above the topographic divide of the range, and that these limbs were not offset by faulting. 
where the erosion surface of the northern flank of the range is buried by Qinghai Lake Basin Fill, they projected the deep of the north limb of the Qinghai Nanshan beneath the basin to a depth of about 500 meters, which is the lower bound for the thickness of sediment beneath southern Qinghai Lake. What I interpret to be the most speculative assumption is that in the western part of the range, in the vicinity of Chaka, and in the eastern part of the range, the prominent topographic saddle marks the presence of a second fault system, such that the range is a composite of two large-scale imbricate faults. Restoration of deformed state cross-sections suggests that the present-day geometries reflect relatively limited shortening across the Qinghai Nanshan, on the order of around 1.5 plus or less 0.7 km. Given that the width of the range is 30 to 40 km, their budgets imply that Cenozoic shortening is less than 10% and perhaps as low as 3%. Notably, the higher shortening estimates come from the far eastern and far western parts of the range, where the presence of multiple imbricate structures appears to require greater total shortening. Along the central part of the range, where the fault system appears to consist of a single structure, shortening estimates range between 0.9 and 1.4 km. Considering that previous studies suggest an initiation age for range growth along the Qinghai Nanshan of 8 plus or less 2 million years ago, this implies average shortening rates of around 0.2 plus 0.2 or minus 0.1 km per million year since the late Miocene. So let's talk about the section where they describe how they reconstructed late quaternary slip rates on the Qinghai Nanshan Fault. To do that, they first mapped the quaternary cover of the Qinghai Nanshan. A sequence of well-exposed alluvial fan deposits is preserved along the southern flank of the Qinghai Nanshan, as shown here in this figure, which are associated with well-defined fault scarps that strike sub-parallel to the range front. So here they wanted to use these features as structural markers for reconstructing fault slip rates. Several alluvial surfaces, like the one in this figure, include the abandoned uh, depositional surface in the uplifted hanging wall of the fault with several generations of terraces in the uplifted alluvium, and in the foot wall of the faults there are intervening active channels that have low terraces perched above them. So here they focus on the QF2 surface because it is present in both the foot wall and hanging wall blocks and therefore provides a useful structural marker. So in the study they did two high resolution topographic profiles measured across deformed alluvial fan surfaces. Profile number 1 is 20 meters to the northwest of profile number 2. Like the figure shows, the, they assume a fault deep of 45 degrees with a standard deviation of 7.5 uh, degrees. To calculate the abandonment age of QF2, they sampled a longer depth profile to determine the in-situ accumulation of beryllium-10 in quartz samples below QF2 uh, surface. Beryllium-10 is a cosmogenic nuclide, so its concentration can be used to find out how long a particular surface has been exposed and or how long a certain piece of material has been buried. They considered two scenarios, 1 and 2, as shown in figure 14. Age constraints from both bracket the true abandonment age of QF2. As such, they suggest that 130 to 160 kilo years is a reasonable range of ages for the timing of surface abandonment. 
They reconstructed fault slip by feeding linear regressions to the topographic survey data from the QF2 surfaces and projecting these surfaces to their intersection with a planar fault. With that, they calculated vertical, horizontal and total slips for the SCARPS profiles. The integration of this data provided for uh, minimum throw rates across the fault of 0.09 plus or less 0.02 mm per year and shortening rates of around 0.10 plus or less 0.04 mm per year. Finally, let's talk about the discussion section of this paper. With the data from this paper and constraints from previous studies, they present their interpreted crustal architecture along a north-northeast striking profile between the Kunlun Fault and the Hushi Corridor transecting the Gongho Basin complex. First, they discuss fault geometries at depth. Coupled with low magnitude of shortening across the Qinghai and Gongho Nanshan, the broad, gently dipping back limbs of the ranges and the broad rain scale anticlines across the ranges are compatible with a fault geometry that becomes curvy planar at depth and also imply that faults likely soul into relatively deep ductile shear zones in the mid to lower crust. So they estimate detachment depths for the Qinghai and Gonghe Nanshan. Across the width of the Qinghai Nanshan, they found that the range bounding fault is likely to extend at least into the middle crust, so at least around 30 kilometers. This depth extent of fault system in this range is also consistent with the mechanical properties of the middle upper crust inferred from geophysical data. Analysis of crustal conductance VP over VS ratios, Bugge uh, uh, gravity anomalies, and shear wave velocities all suggest that localized regions of relatively low viscosity crust appear to be confined to the region proximal to the Kunlun fault and regions to the south. Now, the crust beneath the northeastern Tibetan plateau appears to be comparatively either colder, more rigid, or both. In contrast, the fault system beneath the Gonghe Nanshan appears to soul into a relatively shallow decolment at depths between 7 and 9 kilometers, which probably reflects the bedrock geology underlying the Gonghe Basin complex. So they suggest that the mechanical discontinuity, that is the unconformity, at the base of the Triassic may represent the primary detachment horizon for the Gonghe Nanshan fault network. The original interpretation of crustal architecture characterizes the Chilianshan Nanshan orogenic belt as a doubly virgent orogenic wedge. This is generally consistent with previous interpretations, with the key exception being that they do not envisage that brittle faults extend into the lower crust. In the last section of the paper before the conclusion, they discuss the kinematics and dynamics of faulting in northeastern Tibet. For the Qinghai Nanshan, they found that late Cenozoic shortening rates across the range are of 0.2 plus 0.2 minus 0.1 km per million year, which overlap with late quaternary slip rates of around 0.1 plus or less 0.04 mm per year. They say that this implies relatively steady deformation across the area since the late Miocene. This validates recent estimates of a late Miocene initiation age for the de dextrose stri strike slip uh, Elashan and Ryuyashan faults, which assume steady state deformation in their calculations. Furthermore, it appears as though the major fault networks all around the margins of the Gongho complex initiated over a narrow time window uh, between around 10 million years ago and 6 million years ago. The similar age uh, of fault initiation and the steady deformation imply that the presently active faults have experienced 
kinematically coordinated deformation for a substantial period of time during the late Cenozoic. One thing that they noticed, uh, that they note, is that uh, rock uplift rates in the ranges bounding Goncourt Basin are significantly lower than apparent late quaternary incision rates along the Yellow River. And this reinforces the notion that canyon incision significantly lagged range growth and filling of ponded basins in this part of the Tibetan Plateau. This paper also talks about how shortening is distributed across northeastern Tibet, comparing the rates they found with modern geodetic estimates and other previous studies. If the present-day rate of 4 to 6 mm per year of convergence between the High Plateau and the Hershey Corridor observed in geodetic data is representative of geologic rates, then additional shortening of or strike slip faulting must be distributed elsewhere in northeastern Tibet. One possibility is that shortening may be distributed throughout the Anyemakian Shan and or the Elashan du, um, Dulan Chaka Highlands. Another possibility is that some strain may be absorbed along faults interior to the Chilean Shan. Uh, north of the Qinghai Lake. At present, however, no active faults have been recognized in this region. To the north of the Anyamakan Shan and between... Not only do shortening rates appear to be similar in, on opposing sides of the Chilean Shan, but the initiation ages of major thrust faults appear to be coordinated in time. They say this initiation occurred at around 10 plus or, or minus 2 million years ago, although their own results indicate an age of around 10 to 7 million years ago for the initiation in the Gongho Nanshan and around 6 million years ago for the Qinghai Nanshan in the Chaka region. The similarity in both timing and rate of deformation and the opposing vergence of faults on either flank of the Chilean Shan Nanshan suggests relatively rapid expansion widening of the Chilean Shan Nanshan since the, that time of about around 150 kilometers to the north and east. They provide two possible explanations for that as proposed from uh, previous studies. First, such a regional episode of mountain building could be associated with an increase in topographic stress exerted by the 5 km high plateau on its foreland, possibly transmitted by the relatively rigid Chaidam Basin. Alternatively, this episode could relate to the onset of regional scale transpression during the later stages of orogenesis that followed progressive confinement of Tibet against rigid blocks to the north and expansion of crustal uh, thickening by lower crustal flow to the east. Finally, let's talk about the main conclusions of this paper. They group these conclusions into five main points. First, they present structural, geomorphic and thermochronologic markers to analyze the two S-vergent networks of imbricate truss faults along the margins of the Gonghe Basin complex, the Qinghai Nanshan and the Gonghe Nanshan. Since the late Miocene, the Qinghai Nanshan has accommodated 0.8 to 2.2 km of upper crustal shortening and the Gonghe Nanshan has accommodated 5.1 to 6.9 km. When integrated with previous stratigraphic studies of the timing of deformation along the margins of the Gongho Basin, average geologic shortening rates across the Qinghai Nanshan appear to be 0 0.2 plus 0 0.2 minus 0 0.1 kilometers per million, million years, and rates across the Gongho Nanshan appear to be around 0 0.7 plus 0 0.3 minus 0 0.2 kilometers per million year.
Dating and restoration of the formed alluvial fan surface along the southwest front of the Qinghai Nanshan indicate that late quaternary shortening rates are 0.10 plus or less 0.04 mm per year. These rates are relatively slow and they overlap with average Cenozoic shortening rates across the range. The structural architecture of the Qinghai and Gongke Nanshan fault systems suggests that they sow into the columns in the upper or middle crust. The decolumen depth of the Qinghai Nanshan appears to be at least 30 km, whereas the decolumen depth beneath the Gongke Nanshan is shallower, between 7 and 9 km. The correspondence between post-late Miocene slip rates and late Quaternary slip rates suggests relatively steady deformation since the late Miocene across the northeastern Tibetan Plateau. There appears to occur mirrored, steady and slow shortening along the south virgin fault networks along the Gongha Basin and the north virgin trusting along the northern Chilean Shan Front Range. Both fault systems appear to have initiated between 7 and 10 million years ago, and this implies that the doubly virgent Chilean Shang Nanshan orogeny has expanded outward since the late Miocene. And this is the end of our summary uh, of the paper Rates and Style of Cenozoic Deformation around the Gongha Basin Northeastern Tibetan Plateau. I hope this was useful for someone and thank you for listening. Between 99 degrees east and 101 degrees east, active shortening appears to be accommodated by a race of thrust faults on opposing sides of the Chilean Shang Nanshan. And this is consistent with the description of the region as a doubly virgin orogenic belt. As they have shown in the study, the thrust faults along the margins of the Gongha Basin complex appear to have absorbed 0.6 to 1.4 mm per year of north-northeast oriented shortening over the last 6 to 10 million years. Similarly, previous studies indicate that shortening rates across along the northern Chilean Shan frontal thrust range from 0.4 to 1.1 mm per year to 2.5 mm per year. These shortening rates agree with attendant river incision and erosion rates into uplifted fault blocks across the region, as well as late tertiary rates derived from restoration of crustal scale cross sections. Thus, it appears that shortening rates are approximately symmetrical on opposing sides of the eastern Chilean Shang Nanshan ranges. In total, the geologic data permit 2 to 4 mm per year of shortening across opposing sides of the Chilean Shan, and this appears to account for most of the geode geodetic budget, which is from 4 to 6 mm per year.